Good afternoon and welcome to this lecture with Dr. Seth Jones, who will be discussing three dangerous men, Russia, China, Iran, and the rise of irregular warfare. I'm Laura Dominguez, Vice President of the World Affairs Council of Miami, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization with the commission with the mission to engage the people of South Florida on global issues. Today's program is sponsored by the Honors College at Miami-Dade College. Here with us this afternoon to welcome the many students attending today's event from the Honors College is Dr. Eric Hoffman, Dean of Miami-Dade College's Honors College. Please join me in welcoming Dean Hoffman. Thank you, Ms. Dominguez. On behalf of Miami-Dade College Wolfson Campus and the Honors College, I'm delighted to welcome all the Honors College students to tonight's timely and important discussion by Dr. Seth Jones. In partnership with the Honors College, this event is being brought to you by the World Affairs Council of America, Miami chapter, an independent nonpartisan organization dedicated to engaging the public and leading global voices to better understand the world, America's international role, and the policy choices that impact our daily life and our culture. I am grateful for the World Affairs Council of America's dedication to informative and stimulating programming like tonight's discussion by Dr. Jones which aligns closely with the Honors College mission of providing accessible, high quality educational programming to our students from across the Miami-Dade community. I look forward to more opportunities to help host events such as the Distinguished Speakers Series as our partnership with the Miami chapter of the World Affairs Council of America continues to grow. Now let me hand it back to Ms. Dominguez with the introduction of tonight's speaker. Thank you very much, Dean Hoffman, and a big welcome to the students again who are here with us. It is now a pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Seth Jones. Dr. Jones is a senior vice president, Harold Brown chair, director of international security program and director of the Transnational Threats Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He leads a bipartisan team of over 50 resident staff and an extensive network of non-resident affiliates dedicated to providing independent strategic insights and policy solutions that shape national security. He also teaches at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and the Center for Homeland Defense and Security at the US Naval Postgraduate School. Welcome, Dr. Jones. It's really wonderful to have you here with us today. Thank you very much for that great introduction, Laura, and the comments from Eric Kaufman as well. It's a real honor uh, to be participating in this discussion with the World Affairs Council of Miami. Uh, I feel very at home. I actually spoke to the uh, World Affairs Council in Palm Beach last night. Uh, I was in person, so it was just up the coast uh, from you uh, this morning. Um, and let me just note that uh, uh, before we begin, I'm, I'm going to use slides, but we are at an interesting precipice right now. We have over 100,000 Russian forces uh, preparing a possible invasion of Ukraine. Certainly hope that that does not happen. Uh, but if they were to move across the border and control some or even all of Ukraine or attempt to do it, I think it would have a significant impact on international politics, creating something close to the, uh, the, the Iron Curtain that Winston Churchill uh, so eloquently talked about at the beginning of the Cold War. And this one would be a different one in some ways because that was an iron curtain that uh, sat between Western Europe and the Warsaw Pact. Uh, if the Russians were to advance and seize territory by force, we would see a quick movement to reinforce the Eastern flank of NATO with additional conventional and potentially nuclear forces in the Baltic states and Poland, uh, among others, we would also almost certainly see, and we've already started to see discussions among uh, a range of European countries that are not NATO members about whether it would make sense to become NATO members, including Sweden, for example. 
Um, and, and in that case, that Iron Curtain might extend from the Russian Finland border down through the Baltic states, uh, along the Ukrainian border into the Middle East, including into areas uh, that the Russians have uh, projected power, including in Syria, through Central Asia, where we've just seen the Russians deploy forces into Uzbekistan, through South Asia, including Afghanistan, where the Russians have uh, increased their intelligence footprint, and then along the Chinese-Indian border to the South China Sea, encompassing a huge chunk of the globe uh, to include Russia, China, and others. So it, it would potentially have a serious chilling effect on international politics. In that context, uh, we, are, we are at an interesting position. And let me um, share my screen now. Because what I'd like to do is to begin with a story that the, uh, the, the famous, uh, if you can see the screen, uh, the famous um, uh, British general and military theorist, B.H. Uh, Littlehart spoke about. So he, he describes this journey between the Irish statesman John Wilson Croker and the first Duke of Wellington, and they're walking through the English countryside, and he and the, uh, the general are, are talking about what is on the other side of the hill. You can see it with the title of the slide. And Croker expresses surprise, even awe, that Wellington is able to tell him what is on the other side of every hill. And so uh, Wellington responds, why well, I've spent all of my life in trying to guess what was at the other side of the hill. Uh, Wellington's remark um, then is extended uh, into a definition of what's important for a general, uh, it, particularly in the wider sense of what is happening at the other side of the hill, behind the opposing front and in the mind of the opponent. And that's, I think, what's important for our context here is trying to under understand what is on the other side of the hill, what is in the uh, opponent's competitor's mind, how they think about issues. And really, from our standpoint, a better understanding of what competition means in Beijing, in Moscow, uh, in Tehran, uh, which are the primary countries we'll be looking at here. So if we look at how much of that competition has focused, there's a lot of concern about the prospects for conventional war. We've certainly seen war games, including ones that I've participated in on the left side, about a, a, a Russian invasion of the Baltic states. And that has sort of eerie historical resemblances to the full the gap. That was the area around the inter-German border where uh, both NATO and Warsaw Pact forces during the Cold War amassed conventional forces uh, from the, the Western European perspective, the NATO perspective, there was concern that, uh, that the Soviets and Warsaw Pact countries might invade through the Fulda Gap. Therefore, you would get a conventional, if not a nuclear war. In addition, what we've also uh, seen is concern about a conventional, potentially even a nuclear fight between the United States and its allies and partners and the Chinese over Taiwan, including in and around the Taiwan Strait. These war games, again, including ones that I've participated, have eerie historical resemblances to the Battle of Midway, uh, where we have major forces, obviously much more advanced ones, uh, uh, fighting each other in what would likely be an air-sea battle, possibly a small land one as well, but involving Virginia and Columbia class submarines, aircraft carriers, stealth fighters, and then uh, various types of land attack cruise missiles, ballistic missiles being lobbed uh, at various sides, potentially even including the mainland. I think the, uh, the, the challenge, though, is that this kind of warfare would be highly destabilizing. 
Uh, if we look at some of the analysis that has gone into a conventional and even a nuclear war uh, between the United States, say, and China, uh, what we see is massive casualties you know, in any of the war games, the potential for escalation of a conventional war up to the nuclear level, uh, the potential for a significant decline in gross domestic product, the impact on world trade. And I think as we saw during the Cold War around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, both the Soviets and the United States thought very long and hard about the conventional war. So remember in this context, we had uh, the Soviets placing nuclear missiles in Cuba. The US responded with a blockade and the potential for war. Uh, the Soviets ended up pulling their missiles out of Cuba, but it made both sides recognize the dangers of fighting each other directly since both have nuclear weapons. And that is really where we are at today, uh, where the major powers, the US, uh, the, the, uh, the Russians, the Chinese have nuclear weapons. The Iranians uh, certainly have um, a program and the potential to create nuclear weapons. There are obviously ongoing negotiations about that right now. The North Koreans have nuclear weapons. So the concern today with conventional war between these major powers is they have the potential for uh, engaging directly in uh, combat with each other. And that leads us to really the focus of the book and the focus of this discussion, which is competition and struggle below the threshold of the conventional and certainly your nuclear war, uh, what uh, is often called irregular warfare. And that includes at least four major components. The first is information and disinformation campaigns. It could be from uh, foreign ministries, public diplomacy, militaries, psychological warfare, or potentially intelligence agencies. Um, and there are various examples of this in, uh, in China, in Russia, and in Iran, which we'll get to. In addition, we see a, a lot of these states uh, uh, involved in providing support to state and also non-state partners. So in this case, we see a decision uh, not to fight other countries directly, uh, but to use proxies or partners. Perhaps the, the most quintessential example of this is what we see in uh, the Middle East with the Iranians. The Iranians have provided most of their significant military resources and action to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Quds Force, the paramilitary arm of the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. Uh, they have in turn provided assistance to Lebanese Hezbollah in Lebanon, to the Hashid al-Shabi, the popular mobilization forces, uh, primarily Shia militias in Iraq, the Houthis in, in Yemen, and then various other militia forces in and around the Middle East, including uh, some of the units operating in Syria, some in Palestinian territory, others in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other countries. Third, we have uh, covert action. So these are primarily intelligence services conducting a range of activities, including offensive cyber campaigns. And so uh, I think what we see with a range of the Russian activities, uh, offensive cyber campaigns that we've seen them perpetrate in Ukraine, or even the ones over the past couple of months in the United States, including the colonial pipeline attack, which we'll see in a moment, uh, were examples of covert action, either directly by state intelligence services or indirectly through hacktivists or other organizations working uh, with, by, with, and through uh, those intelligence services. And the final area is economic coercion. So these are examples of countries using uh, economic uh, infrastructure, development, 
and then uh, using that economic uh, trade, for example, uh, for leverage for political purposes. We'll talk a little bit about the Belt and Road Initiative in China, which has certainly been used by the Chinese government for political leverage on issues of importance to China, including the uh, situation within Hong Kong, the Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang province, or Taiwan, Tibet, uh, and countless other issues. So these components are ways that states, even in the West, will compete with each other in order to uh, maximize their own security, expand their influence, and weaken their adversaries, but do it below the threshold of conventional war. So you see what's important here is these aren't really tank movements. This is not the concept of warfare that we may read about in Clausewitz's On War. This is much more warfare that we may read about in Sun Tzu, where uh, as Sun Tzu talks about, this is achieving objectives without fighting. Information, disinformation, support to partners to do the action uh, for them, uh, covert action, and then economic coercion in order to weaken adversaries and uh, 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 support state interests. So these are the key components of irregular warfare. Now, I use the term irregular warfare in, in actuality, when we look at other states, we see different terms for this. So in the Russian context, historically, we've seen the term um, active measures um, and various components of that or similar terms, denial and deception. The Russians have used meskorovka uh, uh, to denote um, uh, deception uh, techniques uh, for foreign policy, national security, and military objectives. Uh, the Iranians have historically used terms like jong e narm And I think what's important here is jong e narm that concept of soft war, is, is non-kinetic. It doesn't use military force, per se. It is, it is much like, for those that have read the work of Joe Nye from Harvard, it's more like soft power. This is the use of... Uh, of uh, Iranian broadcasting overseas, for example, state-run broadcasting in Spanish, uh, English, Persian, of course, Arabic, uh, Mandarin, and other languages to push out generally propaganda because it's state-run media. But look at the term there. They've used the term warfare. So again, not in a Clausewitzian sense of the use of violence, but warfare in the sense of competition to weaken an adversary, and then including in it uh, elements that don't include simply the direct use of violence. The Chinese similarly have had concepts, uh, and include, including today, of the three warfares, uh, San Zhong Zhanfa. Uh, they include first, media or public relations warfare, second, uh, lawfare, and third, psychological warfare, psychological operations. None of these, literally none of them involve kinetic activity, striking targets, the use of battle tanks or aircraft to drop bombs. These are all elements of information, disinformation, psyops to weaken adversaries. Um, and even in the Chinese concept of lawfare, which we'll talk about, it is, uh, it is efforts to influence uh, actors overseas below the threshold of conventional war. Other terms that the Chinese have used, including Daozheng, struggle, both internally and externally. These are all good examples and different terminology of irregular warfare. And really, it's helpful for us to understand, since we're looking on the other side of the hill, how they are conceptualizing them. So let's talk in particular about uh, uh, Russia, China. If we have time, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about uh, uh, the Iranians as well, and then we'll come back to the significance for us in the United States today. Uh, in, in the book, uh, I found it helpful to talk a little bit about 
um, some of the more influential individuals. So in Russia, uh, I do spend a great deal of time talking about the chief of the army staff, uh, Valery Gerasimov, uh, currently still the chief of the army staff, influential both in policymaking, a uh, close advisor to President Vladimir Putin, but also important in conceptualizing uh, how, how Russians think about warfare and competition as the chief of the army staff, but as someone who's also been at the core of speaking publicly about uh, the evolving nature of how Russia competes and what warfare means. And I think what's been interesting in watching uh, Gerasimov in how he operates is really uh, how he's put into practice what he sees the West uh, having done over the past two decades in particular. And you know, there, there are a couple of things that I've found interesting about Gerasimov. He studied very closely US operations. In some cases, probably correctly attributing uh, what the US and other Western countries have done. In other cases, a little bit less so. I don't quite recognize what he's talking about, uh, but at least it's an interesting perception to see how uh, Gerasimov and other Russian leaders certainly perceive US action. And they include the following kinds of things. They've looked very carefully at US operations in Bosnia and Kosovo in the 1990s, the US overthrow of the Taliban regime in 2001. All of those cases uh, really involved minimal US or, or European uh, actual uh, maneuver or ground footprint. Uh, to take territory back. In the Bosnia and Kosovo cases, it was respectively a Croat and uh, Bosnian forces. In the Serbian case, it was KLA, uh, Kosovo Liberation Army. And even in the Afghan case, it was largely Northern Alliance, uh, Pashtun tribes, and then a random assortment of Uzbek, Tajik, Hazara, and other forces that rose up against the Taliban. So in all of those cases, though, there were small numbers of US special operations and intelligence units on the ground. In addition, we saw US aircraft uh, conducting strikes from fixed wing aircraft, uh, and in some cases, uh, shooting missiles from submarines or maritime vessels, including uh, cruise missile strikes against targets. So there, were, there, were four, there, there was force projected from overseas but it was largely leveraging uh, units on the ground. Grasov talks a lot also about the US uh, way of warfare in Libya, which was very similar, small US special operation and French and, and British special operations and intelligence footprint on the ground. Um, and then most of the actual projection of power came from leveraging local maneuver elements, Libyan militias. So what we see is as we begin to see a Russian irregular strategy begin to emerge, <coughs> excuse me, in 2013, 14, and 15, we see several types of examples. First, we see the Russian campaign in Crimea. That was a textbook case of what Sun Tzu calls uh, taking territory without resorting to force. The Russians essentially didn't even fire a shot in Crimea. They deployed uh, Russian Spetsnaz special operations and intelligence units into Crimea, uh, leveraged uh, information and disinformation uh, operations, and then a heavy element of uh, uh, providing assistance, money in particular, to turn some in uh, Crimea uh, to support the Russian government. And within really a matter of days, they annexed uh, Crimea from Ukraine. Again, without resorting to conventional forces. Not long after, in 2014, uh, we saw the, the uh, Russians do two interesting things in Eastern Ukraine. First, we saw them start a war by uh, leveraging um, pro-Russian rebels. Uh, the Russians did deploy some Spetsnaz and other forces into Eastern Ukraine, uh, but they did it clandestinely. They aided uh, rebels with uh, what were often called little green men, 
these were some uh, clandestine Russian soldiers, but without uniforms, at least without patches on those uniforms, and providing much of that assistance clandestinely. In addition, we saw one of the most intense uh, and in some ways effective uh, campaigns uh, of cyber warfare. The Russians used a series of malware, including black energy, Indestroyer, gray energy, to literally take down the critical infrastructure within Ukraine, including causing blackouts in cities like Kiev uh, by Russian intelligence services. The GRU, the main intelligence directorate within the Ministry of Defense, as well as uh, SVR. The GRU component has been characterized and called Sandworm, the GRU unit um, that conducted much of the attack against uh, attacks against Ukraine. We also saw uh, a Russian activity in Syria to help the Syrian regime take back territory. And here again, we see, we do not see the use of Russian conventional forces. Uh, we see some Russian assistance with aircraft and some in maritime vessels, but look at the uh, fighters on the ground, some Syrian units, but then look at a very interesting amalgam of forces the Russians worked with and in, including with the Iranians helped equip, fund, and otherwise support. They included Lebanese Hezbollah, which was instrumental in retaking cities like Aleppo, uh, Palestinian militia that were recruited and trained and then uh, sent to Syria, and then various militia forces trained by the RGC Quds Force, uh, Iran's uh, RGC from Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Pakistan, and a range of other countries. So again, the Russians do not deploy a major presence on the ground, um, conventional presence. Uh, they leverage others to do it interesting example of irregular. So lots of cyber activity uh, and leveraging of local actors. Uh, just briefly to, to summarize a couple of last uh, examples, we continue to see in the US organizations like the SVR and the GRU, Russian intelligence, involved either directly or indirectly in um, and, a, and a number of other attacks. Uh, the Greeley beef plant ransomware, uh, the Colonial Pipeline, which was a uh, Russian hacktivist organization operating in part from Russian soil, which conducted a major ransomware attack against the Colonial Pipeline, which shut down for several days that pipeline between Texas and Linden, New Jersey, and uh, in areas like South North Carolina, Virginia, where I'm talking to you from Washington, D.C., uh, it created long lines uh, at gas stations. In fact, I remember one of the days uh, during this uh, cyber attack, um, I failed at the first eight gas stations to get gas because they were all out. Finally, at the ninth, I had to wait about two to three hours to actually get gas. So really an effective offensive uh, cyber attack by a hacktivist group operating uh, from Russian uh, soil, a good example of irregular activity. Um, and then finally, you know, one of the more interesting examples is we don't see a lot of Russian conventional power projection overseas. Uh, instead, what we see is a major increase in Russian private military companies, including the Wagner Group. Um, and in areas where we've seen the Wagner Group uh, deploy, it is generally in coordination with uh, Russia's GRU, or and or its SVR, its Foreign Intelligence Service. We see the Wagner Group and other Russian private military companies involved in extracting uh, various resources, natural resources, and providing site security, and in some cases, even uh, combat operations in a range of locations in uh, Libya, in Mali, Chad, Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Madagascar, uh, not surprisingly, in areas like the Middle East, where we've seen the Russians deploy, including Syria, but also Ukraine, and then even in Latin America, in Venezuela, seeing increasing uh, 
concerns in Nicaragua of Russian private military companies. So again, these are deniable, uh, but have been heavily involved in expanding a Russian footprint, but in ways that are below the threshold of conventional war. Kind of, it's really the arena that we're talking about. And again, uh, as we're seeing this week, we see uh, Russians poised to potentially move in and around Ukraine. Again, what's interesting here is I don't think, you know, we haven't seen the Russians operate like this uh, directly against the U.S. So I don't think they would. They might consider it, though, against uh, non-U.S. countries, which doesn't risk escalation to nuclear war. When we look at the Chinese, again, we get a very interesting uh, case here. This is the country that has really perfected the art of irregular warfare, um, whether it was Mao Zedong's on guerrilla warfare, which is a essentially a common textbook for how to conduct uh, um, insurgent or guerrilla operations to the Sun Tzu, the art of war, which we've already talked about and which, which includes very interesting and important components of deception and intelligence, the use of intelligence in, in warfare. Again, achieving objectives in part without fighting. Now, one of the areas we've seen the Chinese interestingly involved is in the arena of economic coercion and economic influence. Now, at one level, the Belt and Road Initiative, which includes uh, a series of uh, the Maritime Silk Road, these are, these are um, ports and trade routes uh, along key maritime lines, as well as the Silk Road economic belt which we can see that are mainly land routes uh, through Asia, parts of the uh, Central Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and obviously, uh, in addition, uh, an increase in Africa. They also include a growing number of gas pipelines, oil pipelines, railroads. One of the things we've also seen the Chinese do is um, use the infrastructure that they provide to foreign countries for political leverage on issues that is important uh, or that are important to China. We've seen them conduct uh, pressure campaigns where they have provided significant economic assistance uh, to support issues um, important. Uh, take for example, uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, China has uh, continued to pressure both publicly and privately countries that they provide significant economic assistance uh, for them to support a one China policy vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. That is, uh, do not support a, an independent uh, Taiwan, but one that uh, over time brings Taiwan into China. It's the Chinese uh, position. We've seen them also push back on criticism of Chinese activity in Xinjiang province including what uh, Western human rights uh, 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 organizations, non-governmental uh, non organizations have generally attributed to a genocide occurring within uh, the Xinjiang province uh, directed at the Uyghurs. So there's been an attempt to uh, push back on any of that activity, um, uh, push back on criticism of what the Chinese have done in Hong Kong. Again, uh, the movement in Hong Kong away from a democracy now to a state-controlled uh, state controlled area. And then obviously plenty of other uh, issues, including uh, Tibet. So using economic leverage to pursue political uh, objectives. If Crimea is the Russian example of how to achieve objectives without fighting, the quintessential Chinese example is what happened in the South China Sea. So there we had um, a series of, of atolls, reefs essentially, that almost overnight uh, and contested ones, contested by not just China, but uh, Taiwan, Malaysia, uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries. Uh, the Chinese uh, turned them into military bases. So we can even see here in the satellite imagery that uh, we did at CSIS, of the Fiery Cross Reef. In, in several of these uh, reefs, 
Uh, we see them now, uh, including electronic warfare, signals intelligence or SIGINT platforms, um, runways for fixed wing aircraft, potentially strategic bombers, uh, missile and, and um, uh, missile defense capabilities. So turning ATOLs in, and again, uh, these weren't seized or built uh, by conventional forces, including naval platforms from the PLA, the People's Liberation Army Navy. They were built uh, by dredgers and with the promise that these were being dredged up uh, so that they could be, they could facilitate the uh, movement of uh, fishing vessels and fishermen throughout the South China Sea. Obviously, uh, as we look at uh, what these reefs have become, they are now military bases, uh, certainly not um, areas uh, for rest and, and refit and respite by uh, uh, fishermen, Chinese or otherwise. We continue to see a lot of irregular activity by the Chinese in uh, offensive cyber operations throughout the United States. Uh, some of it is the collection of information from the uh, Office of Personnel Management uh, data hack, which held security clearances uh, to the uh, Equifax attack uh, that probably everybody on this call was impacted by with the People's Liberation Army, one of its main units, uh, stole uh, half of Americans, essentially, um, any of the sensitive information that Equifax and, and other creditors house with your social security number, uh, your credit scores, and any information, good or otherwise, that's held on those. We've also seen uh, the Chinese heavily involved in, um, uh, in espionage and building, for example, the J-31, one of the new stealth aircraft uh, based on espionage directed at the uh, Lockheed Martin F-35. In addition, and I think it's important to note this, we've seen other kinds of activity. You know, one of the most recent ones and discouraging ones in some ways is pressure targeting US and other multinational corporations uh, based on political issues. Note recently the criticism by the general manager of the Houston Rockets and the National Basketball Association or NBA uh, towards uh, Chinese activities in Hong Kong. The Chinese reaction was unless uh, that statement, a criticism on, a, on Twitter was uh, taken back, that the Chinese would pull uh, the NBA off of the airwaves in China. And I, the NBA, after the liberation, decided that the United States is a, a free and open uh, country. We encourage freedom of speech and we protect that. And that no one, including in this case, the general manager of the Houston Rockets was gonna be pun punished for free speech. So the Chinese reacted by taking the NBA off of the airwaves and all of the advertisement revenue that went with that. So that cost uh, the, the NBA almost uh, half a billion dollars in, uh, in uh, what would have been financial incentives from taking the NBA off of, uh, off of Chinese airwaves. Um, and I think pulling, pulling uh, NBA merchandise from stores for a year, if not longer. So serious penalties, again, based on uh, the comments of, uh, of an individual. And so we see a little bit of a concerning development pressuring US uh, companies in this case or, or organizations. There's been a lot of focus in addition on uh, what the Chinese might do in um, taking a, an island like Taiwan. But I think uh, we've also seen a lot of concern, frankly, about gray zone activity uh, using subversion intelligence operations, much like we've seen with Hong Kong. So let me just summarize. Uh, I'm gonna actually skip through Iran. Happy to talk about Iran uh, a little bit later. But we'll see with the national defense strategy that the current Biden administration will um, uh, come out publicly with probably later this month. I saw a draft of it recently. It talks a lot of it about a shift towards uh, the US and the Indo-Pacific. But uh, two, two big comments along these lines. One is I think we're seeing competition that is increasingly global in scope. Uh, we saw the Belt and Road Initiative 
We saw Russian private military companies operating in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Europe. And that is really what we're likely to see. It's irregular competition that is global in nature, including involving uh, cyber operations, offensive and defensive, which obviously are, uh, uh, which include operating on in the cyber domain, which really knows no physical boundaries. A second related issue is uh, that more than anything else, this is really uh, an irregular competition of ideas. And, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna say that, that cooperation is impossible, it's not. We, we should see and hope to see plenty of US and Russian, US and Chinese cooperation on some aspects of trade, hopefully climate change, possibly counterterrorism, counter narcotics, and, uh, and, and, and plenty of other issues. But there, there, in my view, there is and there will be an element of competition between these kinds of countries that will be inevitable and is inevitable because their systems are antithetical to each other. Uh, with the US and its uh, allies and partners, most of them in Europe and the Indo-Pacific, South Korea, Japan, Australia, what we see is either democratic states that support freedom of uh, the press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, an open economic uh, system, a capitalist one. Uh, in China today and Russia and even Iran, we see a closed internet. Uh, we see uh, state-run media. We see uh, uh, not democratic, but authoritarian regime. This impacts the way that these countries expand influence. It impacts the way these countries uh, also deal with companies, deal with criticism. And so at the end of the day, let me just close with a comment that as challenging as the US political system may be today with its polarization and its warts, you know what you get with the United States. One of the both upsides and challenges of a democracy is you see everything that goes on inside because we are free. We can vote for whoever we want and we are free to, uh, we, we have generally freedom of speech, freedom of criticizing political leaders. That's a good thing. Uh, at the same time though, um, uh, you know, we also see that many of these countries we're dealing with are vulnerable. And I'm happy to talk about ways we can, the US and its allies and partners can think about competing more effectively, including in the irregular arena uh, with, uh, in these areas. It's important to note that this irregular competition has bled into culture and movies. One of the most heavily watched movies in China I've watched it, worth watching. Not a particularly good Hollywood type movie, but it's all right. Certainly influential is Wolf Warrior II. And this is the quintessential irregular movie. It doesn't take place in Taiwan or in the Indo-Pacific. It takes place in Africa. It takes place not between infantry soldiers, but between special operations and private military companies. And China pits itself in this case directly against the United States. The main enemy in this case, uh, this guy's name is Big Daddy uh, for, for the US. It's got a kind of a Texan drawl uh, when he speaks. So we see this irregular competition really playing out in culture and movies as well. And the reason much is at stake in this irregular arena is, and I'll leave you with this and we'll turn it back to the discussion and question and answer component is really chilling data coming out of Freedom House. Uh, 2020 and, and then 2021, they were the 15th and 16th consecutive years of a decline in global freedom, of an erosion of democracy across the globe. And I think what is really concerning in this context is what is at stake in irregular warfare. 
below the threshold of armies invading is clandestine, covert efforts to weaken the US, its democratic system, its economic system, again, through uh, a shadow war, whether it's the three warfares that we've seen from the Chinese Jongin arm, the soft war, uh, or active measures. And so this is what is at stake in what this book uh, talks about. So with that, I will stop and, and open this uh, back up. Uh, Laura, should I turn this back to you? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, those were very concerning statistics indeed. Really appreciate you sharing your insights. It's such a timely and important topic, Dr. Jones. Uh, thank you. So now I'd like to open the floor up for a question and answer. You'll see on your screen that there is a raise hand feature and uh, one at a time you will be unmuted and televised so that you could ask your question. So please raise your hand and uh, you will be turned on with the mic um, as in order as you raise your hands. Laura, I do see two questions which I can get to as well in the, uh, uh, in the chat. Fantastic. Uh, you, I mean, uh, the, mm -hmm, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. no. Uh, if you want to read it, that's fine. Sure. Okay. So it says here, um, saw this term a lot in the press a while ago. Is that why they called this the wolf warrior diplomacy from China? And that's from Ian. Ian, yes, exactly. Uh, the, the, uh, the term wolf warrior generally comes from the wolf warrior series of movies. Uh, so uh, Wolf Warrior 2 is the one that I talked a little bit about uh, where the, uh, uh, we, we see Chinese depiction of competition with the US using mostly irregular means in Africa. Um, and it has gone on to really include what I would say is a little bit more, uh, some might call it confident, some might call it belligerent, um, uh, Ch Chinese diplomatic activity. I mean, one of the, probably the quintessential examples of wolf warrior diplomacy was uh, what we saw in the early stages of, uh, of the uh, uh, coronavirus crisis and the pandemic in, um, uh, particularly in the spring and the summer of, of 2020, where uh, China went public, including government officials went public with uh, comments that the origins of the virus actually did not come from Wuhan, whether they came from a lab or from bats or, or other uh, 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 you know, wet, wet market, they actually came from US uh, troops that had participated in these, uh, uh, some kind of sports game at the end of 2019 in, in, uh, in, in the Wuhan area, which uh, you know, that whole thing was entirely um, fictitious of you know U.S. soldiers bringing in uh, the virus. What it did smack of, though, is an, a, a very effective irregular service A of the KGB campaign during the Cold War, which was called Operation Infection by uh, the Warsaw Pact Security Services, and by the KGB as Operation Denver, which uh, was a covert uh, irregular campaign. Uh, disinformation campaign, which attributed uh, the AIDS virus to the either accidental or purposeful release of the virus from uh, U.S. labs at Fort Detrick, Maryland. So interesting uh, that we have a, and, and, and so we saw Chinese diplomats really publicly arguing that the origins of the virus were coming from the United States. So this was kind of an, 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 a quintessential example of of that wolf warrior diplomacy, which I would say, you know, is in largely in this irregular arena. The next question will be from John Patrick Reyes. John, if Hello. you would okay. Yeah, hi. So my question is about uh, what recently happened in Kazakhstan. 
And I know that it's, you know, it's bordered in between Russia and China. And they do have uh, some relations with China, but they do not have good relations with Russia, which um, questions for me, like what this recent uh, turn of events that happened in Kazakhstan has to do with uh, general U.S. diplomacy. So just to be clear, you're, you're talking about the Russian deployment of uh, forces into uh, Central Asia. Are you talking about uh, is, that, is that what you're talking about, the, the paratroopers um, and the rioting that was taking place, the Russian response? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, th that and uh, also like troll farms in, uh, in Russia and in disinformation campaigns through social media in the United States. I have also been interested in that and was wondering your comments on that. Yeah, so uh, just, just in general, I mean, what we have seen is the... Uh, is the Russian government, and understandably so in some ways, uh, attempting to reassert itself in areas that it considers a sphere of influence. So, uh, I mean, we've seen, we've seen Russian support for the immigrants uh, from Middle East countries that were pushed to the borders of Belarus and Ukraine, uh, sorry, uh, Poland, uh, Belarus and Poland, we had that classic irregular uh, tactic to put pressure on the Poles, a uh, NATO member. Uh, we've seen um, Russians uh, increasingly active in pushing uh, clandestine units into Afghanistan after the withdrawal of, of uh, U.S. military forces. We've seen in this case over, uh, in Central Asia, the uh, U.S., uh, sorry, the Russian deployment of forces, including paramilitary forces, largely to backstop rather than to conduct action themselves. I mean, I'd be really surprised to see the Russians actively using conventional force. It's really, uh, it's really sending a message. I think what's particularly important is that the, the Russians are photographed and videoed uh, sending in some small numbers of elite, often special operations forces into these kinds of countries so that it, it is a signal that it is a sphere of influence. And this is, this is where Ukraine comes into that category as well. The last comment you made, and this, let me just come back to one of the, the final comments I made here, which is, you know, this, I mean, in my view, this really is a serious competition of ideas and, and systems at play. And so if you look at Russian disinformation on US platforms, uh, whether it's the 2016 election in the U.S., the 2020 election in the U.S., or the manipulation of major polarizing events. We've seen the Russians involved in uh, creating kind of front companies and, and, and front platforms on social media entities, Facebook, uh, you know, Twitter, and, and others like that. Um, it's to, it's to uh, sow disorder. We've seen them do it on, on all sides of Me Too movement, on all sides of, of Black Lives Matter, gun control. The, the goal is to weaken democracy. I mean, I think that is, and, and, and I think that objective really has to be understood. There's a much bigger picture in this global competition. And this is why we've seen even uh, so much Russian and Chinese effort focused on uh, the January 6th incident or the, the, the uh, various debates within the US trying to highlight that democracy is not successful. This is an irregular campaign used again to weaken the US and its system. And I think it has to be understood in that context. So thanks for your questions. They, they're, kind of, they're exactly in this arena. AKS has a question and it says, how do you see the competitive space in the Western hemisphere? How should the US organize to compete from a whole of government approach to assist partners with resiliency to protect against these gray zone tactics? Yeah, and, and uh, uh, thanks for the, the question. The, the, the term I use irregular warfare, I mean, I, 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 I use warfare in part be, because that's what all of the countries that I highlighted here, they use warfare 
in a Sun Tzu rather than a Klausowitzian term. But you do see other terms that are, I would call them essentially synonyms, uh, asymmetric, political warfare, or gray zone. Uh, so gray zone is, is what I'm talking about, We're essentially the same uh, arena. So in the Western hemisphere, um, there, is, there has been some activity. So let's take the Russians, for example. Uh, during the last US administration, uh, there was the possibility for regime change in Venezuela, and the Russians pushed in, and this was not necessarily widely known, to the uh, uh, private military companies, including the, the Wagner Group, to provide uh, uh, protection to the Venezuelan leader, uh, both a, a physical protection, but also uh, defensive uh, cyber efforts to protect against uh, what they considered U.S. and other Central Western efforts to conduct uh, cyber operations against the Venezuelan government. So we've seen the Russians involved in that kind of activity, um, seen them involved in private military companies in Central America as well. Chinese, though, we've seen significant amounts of assistance uh, into, into China. Um, along the lines of sort of the Belt and Road Initiative efforts, providing assistance to countries and then pushing them to pursue uh, political stances that are supportive of China. So again, one, one country, China and Taiwan, not two, uh, pushing back against this human rights uh, strong argument that Uyghurs have been persecuted in Xinjiang. The Chinese have encouraged countries to push back and say that that's just a fabrication, that's disinformation. So uh, we've seen growing activity in and around the Western hemisphere along those lines. Um, I think you know the, the US can do a, a range of activity in this area. You asked what kind of whole of government approach. Um, I, I think in general, probably the biggest uh, biggest activity the U.S. really is poorly structured to do right now is public diplomacy. I mean, that's a traditional, it's been a State Department function. It's not uh, intelligence, it's not CIA activity, it's not military, it's not psychological warfare, it's basic public diplomacy. During the Cold War, the U.S. had a very well, especially the latter part of the Cold War, very well-funded U.S. information agency. And it had, you know, very well-funded Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, Voice of America. We are so poorly funded and poorly structured today to deal uh, with um, an information campaign globally. I think we, th th this is a really important part of this um, that I think the White House needs to understand that a chunk of this competition is in the information sphere, and we are poorly organized and structured to do it. We don't even have what we had during the Cold War, the Foreign Broadcast Information Service, which translated huge amounts of Soviet, Czechoslovak, and other material from Russian or Czech or Polish into English. We don't, that's it. Today, it's called the Open Source Enterprise. It's not publicly available. You can't see translated Chinese material. We are so, we, we, we do not understand what is going on in these countries and the debates that are happening. And we are poorly positioned on the information sphere. So from my perspective, that's probably at the top of what we should be doing in terms of a whole of government approach. And it is, it is traditionally at its core, a public diplomacy State Department function. And we just don't have anything really like it right now. The next question is from Carol Feldman. Can you discuss anti-satellite warfare? Yeah, and uh, this is probably uh, 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 probably best captured in the ASAT test that the Russians uh, conducted recently in space, which actually caused a range of debris scattered across uh, uh, orbit uh, around the US impacted the International Space Station. I mean, I would just say this is another example, much like cyber, where we see uh, countries operating below the threshold of conventional warfare. 
what we're seeing on the satellite side, both with satellite capabilities and anti-satellite capabilities is uh, collection of information and, uh, and then attempts to counter it without resorting to tanks and blowing things up, uh, but really to, um, to monitor activity and then to, uh, uh, to uh, attempt to destroy those capabilities. So I think this is another example of, uh, of the, this uh, uh, covert uh, action that's taking place just below that conventional. Talked a little about cyber in the discussion, but satellite definitely in the same, uh, same arena. One last question that came in from Jay Frati. Do you think Putin will be president of Russia until he dies? Well, you know, one of the countries we talked about, interestingly, is China. And it does appear that Xi Jinping is probably going to be leader for life. Uh, Putin, I think it's, it's partly um, up to him right now. I mean, Putin, I think, is 70 right now. Uh, and uh, he has essentially been a uh, Russian leader, except for a, a brief period where he, uh, where Medvedev was Russian leader. I think it's up to him. Um, and I think part of it may actually depend on uh, his popularity and support at home. If the Russian economy manages to uh, be reasonably stable over the next couple of years, which is an open question, um, if he, if Putin is careful about uh, not conducting action, which leads to a you know large scale killing of Russian soldiers, the a Ukraine invasion could go badly if we saw an insurgency, much like what we saw with the Soviet Union in Afghanistan in the 1980s, and 15,000 dead Russian soldiers. So if he's careful along those lines, uh, from an economic perspective, and from a military perspective. I think we certainly could see uh, Putin continue as a Russian leader for the foreseeable future. If he makes mistakes, big mistakes, Russian military uh, officials can and have historically been willing to assert themselves and sort of raise question about a succession plan. So uh, we'll have to watch, but I think Putin is certainly in a position right now where if he's careful, could certainly be Russian leader for, if not life, uh, for a significant amount of time. Okay, and um, I think it's time to wrap up. We are a few minutes over six o'clock. Thank you everyone for all of your questions. We are out of time. The World Affairs Council of Miami thanks you, Dr. Jones, for sharing your knowledge and all of this interesting information. We really appreciate it. We also want to thank uh, Dean Hoffman, uh, Virginia Fuyerdat, and the student body at the Honors College at Miami-Dade College. A special thanks to Celeste Simon, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Palm Beach for her support. And if you'd like to attend more events like today's lecture, please sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media by going to our website, www.worldaffairs.miami. Thank you so much and wishing everyone a fantastic week.